Can you hear me okay? Nope. One more time? Nope. No more times? Hi, everybody. Yay! Woo! All right. Woo! Hi. Uh, I have so many slides, like a hundred and some th thousand slides. So, we're going to. All right. Hi. This is Ember on Vail's Real Talk. That's the name of the talk. This is also the name of the talk. I'm Brandon Hayes, uh, to Viking on Twitter. I am a Rubyist by training. Um, not sure if I'm allowed to tell you who I'm a contractor for. Uh, they're an American company in the telegraph, and telephone business. The logo looks like the All star. All right. Uh, I didn't use the program. That's not what we're here to talk about. Uh, I am not a fan of animating things in presentations, but this presentation has two animations in it. So keep your eyes peeled. All right. So this is not my story. This is a story of an unnamed developer named Brendan. So, OK, he has a name. All right, it's not me. It's like some similarly named person. Brendan is like leveling up in Rails and getting to be pretty confident. He loves Rails. It's easy to get an application up and running. Uh, he knows his gem file really well. He can bootstrap an application, have agile development automatically install itself. It's so awesome. Every line of code does like 25 things and hires four developers for him. Brendan has got opinions. Uh, in his short time as a developer, he's gotten a disproportionate amount of opinions. Uh, so a web page is a document. Somebody told him so, do you believe so? Web, it's for displaying content. A simple, flexible web stack is the way to go. You want your web pages to be snappy, and you want to keep your focus on your users. Uh, he's from the church of the 80% use case. I think they have missionaries that go two by two and <laughs> teach people about DHH's plan for Apple-like focus on the 80%. And MVC fits that. It's a great 80% use case for the web. Uh, it's thoroughly ad adopted in the web world, and it separates concerns in a maintainable way. And the only problem with this is that that works great on the server, uh, but how much of your app, think about this, how much of your application is actually written in JavaScript? I think you'll actually underestimate it, but if you look at GitHub, GitHub will tell you that a lot of your application is written in JavaScript. And so now experts are like, oh, you need MVC on top of your MVC. All right, OK, when does this madness end? <laughs> right? So like, put MVC in your MVC so you can develop web applications while you develop web applications. <laughs> right? This is like maybe not sitting exactly right. That sounds weird. So I wouldn't call them a hater, per se, but, but maybe a little skeptical that this thing, this solution, will make him happy. The thing is, there's this problem. Brandon's boss comes in saying, oh my gosh, she's just tears streaming down her face. Google Reader is dead. Can you believe this? Like, how could Google do this to me? We are going to do something about this. I have nothing to read anymore. But the good news is times have changed, and we all get our news from Twitter anyway. So picking through the noise of Twitter to try to find the news that's relevant and valuable uh, and clicking on links isn't very good to do. So uh, let's fix that. Let's build something. So Brendan is like, OK, let's do it. All right, you're on board. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing the laundry list of features come down. And it starts getting cringy. And it's like, oh, so we want to have like multiple kinds of filters and have them like live update on the screen in real time. And this is starting to start. Basically, down this road lies an intense uh, kind of pain. When you're trying to build a sophisticated user interface uh, that involves persistent state, you're going to feel unique and new forms of pain. So basically, if you remember, if you've done this kind of stuff before, and I'm, I'm almost certain you have if you work in Rails. You write the controller to serve the HTML, to store the data attribute in the DOM, to give the AJAX call, to send to the controller, to grab more HTML, to stuff into the template, to catch the fly, and we don't know why the fly, and we'll probably all die. And something about this feels a little dirty, right? <laughs> so this is time consuming. It's trying to bend the web into this pretzel shape, uh, trying to hold all this info in our heads when we're trying to debug like one simple problem that's bouncing around a lot of different concerns. But there's like, jQuery plugins to do pretty much everything. They're like Rails gems, except they also have UI on them. It's like, oh, it's got all my CSS. It's awesome. So you have like one plugin, and it helps. Two plugins help a little less, and then three plugins start to really hurt. So now you have a couple of choices ahead of you. It's one thing to scale back on features, but it's another thing to scale back on the user experience for those features. So I don't feel like putting UX in the corner. By the way, this is all Dirty Dancing references. You guys, buckle up. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> So I think we can pretty much dismiss this outright. 
but we do it more than we like to admit. We subconsciously often limit ourselves in what we can do with user experience um, because of limitations in the technology that we're sitting on top. So the other choice is like, all right, Brendan's ready to take the high road and go ahead and suck it up and write the ball of mud. What does that look like? Well, literally no one even knows, like computers. So you have uh, some of your JavaScript is in script tags. Sometimes it's in your gen file. Sometimes it's in your vendor assets. Sometimes it's in your regular assets. Sometimes it's in your controller actions. And heaven help you if it is in your streams stored in like your lib folder. But I have worked on that application. So also, I'd like to introduce a new database called DomDB. Uh, it's a really awesome place to store really important data, and it's on your web page. So you serialize everything out to your web page, and then use your web page to manipulate the data, and then like suck that back up into your server. And the great news is you're already using it. So it's like I've already got market penetration. So maybe, maybe that's not so reliable. Uh, and maybe it's kind of hard to chase down problems in it sometimes. Uh, in my experience, uh, I don't know. I, don't, I, try to, I try not to think about it. I don't sleep at night. Brendan doesn't sleep at night either. So all you can do, like Han Solo, is just like hold on and say, please, please, code base, hold together. The thing is, this was supposed to be fun. Like, we got into this thing because this is all like, web, building web applications is like exponential benefit for some amount of effort. But every tweak and every feature that we use, that we add, seems to break previous ones. And you're suddenly like doing stuff with JavaScript that you may not completely understand, like e prevent default. E stop propagation. Stop immediate propagation. <laughs> OK, well, it's, events are bound to this. Like, all right, I am now officially underwater. Um, he just wanted to build cool stuff, but this took all the fun out of it. So, all right, so he trepidatiously steps toward a JavaScript framework. He's desperate enough to try something, and this JS framework promises to bring sanity instead of this disparate and fragile code that we often rely on. But the real question here is, can Brendan ever be happy using a JS framework? Because it's about developer happiness. That's the mission of Ruby, and that's kind of what we'd like to carry forward, even when we work in other languages. Uh, there's a trick to this. There is a proliferation of JavaScript frameworks out there. Uh, look at Sammy, Backbone, Spine, Angular, Knockout, Batman. I could invent names of like six more and you'd believe me. <laughs> so the, the number one concern here is are these things going to be around a year from now to be supported and to be continually used? Uh, I have a couple of dead ones in, in code bases that are no longer maintained. Um, that's not super fun. But Brendan tried several and for various reasons that we will not get into until if we have time for bonus slides, uh, he landed on Ember. So let's take a shot at it. All right, let's get going here. All right, gem install. All right, OK. And from the command line, you Rails generate Ember bootstrap, and you have Ember in your application. All right, gem install. Like, I know this. We're off to the races. But there's already some challenges. There's already some challenges. And the initial challenge is, hey, wait a minute. Ember wants to own big chunks of the UI. It's not, like it can, it's not like it can't be dropped into an existing app. It's just that from that point forward, from when you drop it in, it kind of wants to drive from URLs to everything. That's a little more than a sprinkling of JavaScript that we're told that we're supposed to want. Uh, but Brendan goes ahead and soldiers on. So he jumps in and says, all right, like how do I get going with this? Gosh, it's just not that much code. You use your controller and, and set up a basic controller and route everything to that if you want a, a full uh, Ember controlled web application, you just route everything to Ember and say, you handle this. I don't, I don't feel like it. So, and then uh, getting an app out into the world from the Ember side is really minimal. You define a router, tell it to go somewhere, and spit out uh, some text in your application, like your application HTML and ERB. And we'll talk about that outlet thing in a second. So like, all right, we have Hello World. Okay, we can go home. Everybody knows Ember. And uh, there's really, I mean, that was saved us a huge amount of time in building a web app. Uh, the reality is it's more complicated than that. But to get into the next step, Rails has taught us many things about MVC that are not bad, but they just don't fit. Um, so for one thing, though, to start with, models are pretty much what you're already expecting them to be. Uh, models have two jobs. They define and they hold properties for domains, models. Uh, and they also can retrieve and persist changes, although that's kind of added in if you decide to use a persistence framework. Routes are already like, going to be way off what you expect. Now, there's a thing called AppRouter.js. We'll look at it in a minute. It's going to be pretty much what you 
are thinking of in terms of what a, a routes file should look like, except for then it passes to a routes handler that does a bunch of heavy lifting, like grabbing a model object, stuffing it into a controller, and passing it along, which sounds a lot in Rails like what a controller does. OK, so what the heck are these for? Well, controllers are not at all like Rails controllers. Uh, they are purely for decorating the, the model to add logic for display. And again, this is just to point out the fact that these are different from what you're expecting, and we'll go through it in a second. And, the, and there's something else I'll show you where I'm not going to even try explaining as well as someone else did. So views are also not what you expect. Uh, they're not templates. Um, I've actually sort of broken myself of the habit of calling templates views. Uh, in Rails even actually has uh, a view layer in between what a controller does and handing it off to the template. That is pretty much hidden from you. Uh, but you can grab hold of that and start messing with it. Um, they're optional. They're just for handling user input and display logic. And lastly, it uses handlebars for templating. I don't know if any of you have used handlebars or any of its uh, kissing cousins for, uh, for Rails stuff, but it's actually pretty cool. Uh, handlebars is really powerful. It's not like mustache is very logicless and, and very militant about not doing that stuff, about putting any logic in your template. And handlebars is like its cooler cousin. It's like, yeah, like you can smoke, just go outside, go out back, like it's fine. Just don't, just put it in a helper. And uh, it has really cool little features like else for zero state. So I explained this so poorly at, a, at an Ember.js meetup that somebody else felt compelled to in the immediate next month to get an entire talk fixing all the stuff that I broke uh, and then turn it into a screencast that I highly recommend you check out, actually, no matter whether you decide to use Ember or not but breaking down the concepts of model view controller uh, kind of from the ground up. So even more challenges. Uh, Brendan goes and searches for help. So he's trying to build his application, and he searches for help on the new router. And scumbag stack overflow returns clear and concise answers on a syntax that nobody's used for over a year. <laughs> so what? All right, and for data. So we need to persist data to the database. Uh, and Brendan could only find Ember data. And, or you could try to figure out how to write the entire persistence layer from scratch yourself, because I guess that's kind of JavaScript culture. Um, except the only persistence library in town was publicly declared to be not ready for public consumption. OK, wait, what? All right. And then keeping up with the framework, like, like multiple betas, RC1 through RC6 and now RC6.2, uh, Ember data betas, uh, handlebars betas, and every single upgrade seemed to break some subtle dependency between all three of them, and you're triangulating this stuff and uh, fixing things that broke, and, and Brendan dutifully went through this process over and over again. I'm sorry, what? So the thing is, <laughs> these challenges are specific to picking up and running with a brand new framework in beta. Uh, that's just the long and the short of it. You have to. Understand that this is more like Rails 0.14.3. If any of you are old timers enough to remember that, I'm literally not, but my old timer friend helped me with that. So uh, it's not Rails 3. It's not 2.3. Uh, it's certainly not Rails 4 yet. Uh, all right, so we understand now. We've got the boilerplate done. We've covered core concepts, and we've accepted this is a framework that's a little bit in a flux, although stabilizing. Uh, but we've got to build a Twitter news feed reader. Let's get going on this. You ready to get going? We should get going. All right, let's dive in. So we want to start reading shared links through Twitter. Uh, we're going to design our URLs right up front. So the first thing that we do is we decide, all right, we have a thing called shared items. It is a thing. And, and immediately we see that there's a nested shared item. If you use Rails, this should look pretty familiar, um, not super revolutionary. Uh, we're using the history API, but you can use that the older style if you have to support older browsers. Uh, there's also, now that passes to a route, so instead of uh, a controller immediately taking that on, we're actually pointing it to a route that decides what controller comes next. And here, we're going to go grab all the shared items. This is actually using Ember model to go grab all, of, all the shared items from the Rails server behind the scenes and pass that to the controller of the same name. So it's important to note, we're not writing this controller yet. We're skipping right over that. Ember wrote that controller for us. So all Handlebars is doing is saying, hey, we got a model here. Let's iterate over it uh, and link to each one. And if there isn't anything, we're going to say no items. So that's that cool uh, else helper on it iterators. It's just kind of really handy. And then outlet. Uh, what is that outlet for? That outlet is actually tied to the nested route. So we have shared items, which is, has a collection of shared items. 
that, and we decided that underneath that route, when somebody clicks on any link that links to the route underneath it, it will take you to the shared item. And that's this. Super complicated code. Look out, everybody. It's got a URL in it. Don't worry, I'll show you a little more about how this actually fits together visually in a second. API, it's just Rails. Okay. The thing is, this style of coding will change the way that you think about building web applications. And that's, that's really what I want to get across today. Rails, thanks to Active Record, is, is super awesome and super wonderful, but it's database dominated. You think about from day one, from minute one of your application, how is this thing going to be stored? Uh, you become experts on data normalization just by nature of the fact that we're using Active Record to persist. Uh, Ember is URL and user experience dominated. How is this thing going to be used? And th this structure of taking this data, putting it into a pool uh, out of your, from your server to your client and letting the client then do whatever it wants and define the, the user experience models however you want, is an extremely valuable abstraction. Uh, for instance, I, I, it made me start using more non-persistent models. Maybe it's just going to go grab some stuff from API, not persist it, and just display it to a user. All right, this is, this is like a totally, hopefully this is not too confusing, but uh, the outer red box, it's the entire application route. And application route renders application template. And it, it's by default hitting the, the slash root route. And we're kind of also stopping on the slash root route here. When you hit the slash root route, we, use the share, we hit the shared items route. And we just render that into its application outlet. We saw that application had an outlet. We take whatever was in the shared items and stuff that into that outlet. And then we render. Remember how we iterated over all of those links? Well, if you click one of those links, it will render into its own outlet the next thing down in the shared routes until you run out of them. And we didn't, because we were just displaying the URL and whatever comes with that content. Um, all right, I'm going to do something insane. I'm going to attempt to live demo what this looks like. Look how beautiful my beautiful, beautiful, beautiful butterfly is. So Brendan built it, and he brings it to his box, and she says, this is really cool. You got this going in how long? Like a couple hours? Like, yeah. And so does it do anything besides very slowly over cellular connection load these links? No, it does not. OK, we'll get back to work. All right, fine. But hey, well, so here's what we haven't done. It works. It's obviously not even close to complete. We haven't put together a complex UI. We haven't uh, put together any Twitter off. We haven't put together any semblance of real life usage. Uh, but what we have done is we've already, uh, we've already defined some of the domain model, some of the URL design, defined needs for our API, and we've got some stuff on the screen, which is pretty awesome. Um, it's flipped our model from data-centric to UX-centric. So now some, some real talk. Ember has been really challenging for Brendan to use getting up to this point. We started about eight months ago. It was very, very painful. Um, if you've experimented with Ember in the past and you've been frustrated, Brendan is totally with you. Uh, it's totally understandable. It's right there. The thing is, today, I can say uh, personally from my experience and Brendan from his experience that this is a ready application framework now. Uh, it's ready and it's awesome. So here's a couple hard problems that, that existed before that have been resolved in the last, seriously, maybe month, two months. Uh, data, authentication, and closing div tags. OK, so if there's a closing div tags, like, that's going to be your responsibility still. But that really will mess your application up. So close your div tags, everybody. Uh, data, Ember model. Remember how we said Ember data? Well, the thing is, Ember data is still not ready. And it's a, one of the most ambitious JavaScript projects I've ever laid my eyes on. It's beautiful. It's just not ready to use. So Ember model is like a stripped down, uh, go-kart fast version of that that's totally customizable. And you can do whatever you want. And this should look pretty basic. This is your model definition. We're defining some attributes setting you out to go get it and telling it that it's restful. And you don't do anything else. It's embarrassingly easy to use. Uh, find goes and gets all of them. Find with an ID goes and gets that ID. And you can save it, and it will persist it. There's like no like crazy stuff going on here. Um, hi. Apparently, there's two microphones here somewhere. All right. Oh. We good? OK. Can you guys hear me over there? Yeah. Woo! All right, OK, I'll try to be quiet. So all right, uh, 
Authentication was really hard with Ember before. It's really easy now because they've changed routes to be asynchronous. I won't get into the details of it, but basically, I'm going to show you a really naive solution that I got up and running in like very, very short amount of time. Uh, I use my, I, I set an application token, uh, randomly generate it, put it in Ember, and just check for that. If it doesn't fit before I load the model, kick the ba user back out to the landing page. So that's when Brendan found the treasure chest a backbreakingly huge, heavy treasure chest. It nearly broke Brendan's brain. And uh, my friend Dave Brady says that's because when you break your brain, it means there needed to be a hinge installed there. So basically grasping some of these concepts really shook his OO foundations and made him feel really dumb. Because Brendan is an imperative programmer by training. This is what I want. This is how to do it. Go do it for me. Bring it back to me. Shut up. <laughs> OK, so Ember is about declarative programming, about saying what you want and I don't really care how you do it. Uh, how, how, like I, uh, this broke his brain. So declarative takes away all of that how and just leaves you to ask what. But the thing is, it doesn't have to be that complicated to explain. Think uh, like a big V8 diesel truck trying to push something up a hill. Instead, think San, in San Francisco, you have this cable car. Cable cars work by this crazy pulley system underneath the city and you just latch onto it and it carries you around. All the work is being done underneath the surface, and all you do is you declare what you were bind to, and it will take you around the city if you'd like. So instead of trying to get bigger and bigger engines and more and more complicated, you actually just say, I just want that, and let it carry you around. You don't necessarily have to understand all the complex stuff going underneath. And this is what is referred to when people say, like there's almost a stereotype in Emberland that says, wow, look at what you can do with so little code, because you just say what you want. Uh, it uses a pattern called functional reactive programming. Um, it is too complicated for me to explain. Uh, it works like Excel. It's not too complicated. I just don't understand it well enough to explain it to you. Um, basically, it's Ember's own take on this pattern. And it's not pure functional reactive programming according to some of the people I talked to, but it basically leads to Ember's killer feature. So the only request I got in giving this talk was please do not give another talk about why computed properties are so great. But computed properties are so great. They're so great. <laughs> Um, it's sort of a four-dimensional uh, concept, so I'm just going to have to show it to you. All right. Well, the good news is Brendan has been working real hard, and he like put CSS in here and everything. And he actually realized something uh, last night uh, talking to his friend. His friend said, hey, you know what I just realized? This thing isn't for sharing news links with Twitter. This is for starring animated GIFs on Twitter and gathering all of those. So he decided he was going to build some features around browsing news that comes in. It imports uh, on the Rails side, imports all the links from Twitter, uh, and just renders them out to the Ember app. So now we have awesome animated GIF browser. <laughs> so there's so much with this I want to show you. But let me show you some of the stuff. Look at down here at the numbers, which I can't read, but I'm assuming they're changing. Do you see these uh, red, unread numbers changing? Yeah. So these are different filters that I've applied just by declaring uh, a basic computed property that I'll show you in just one second. But the, the idea is uh, I, that these things will update. I actually wrote no code to get those numbers. I just said, watch those. Just give me that property. And Ember is calculating all of that stuff underneath the surface. And when I'm applying multiple filters, like just show me animated GIFs and only show me unread ones because I'm so bored with those old ones. Oh, that's nice. That's a good one. Uh, what about this one? All right, now they're red, so they go into the red pile. I don't know why that one <laughs> that gets me every time. <laughs> and he, he was also asked to add JK navigation. Oh, cool, JK navigation. That was easy. All right. So uh, this was always supposed to be just for animated GIFs. But all of these things are things that I have done before. Uh, and, and definitely Brendan has ha had to do this before, and many of you have probably had to do this before, where you use jQuery to update these things. And then your next two weeks is a hell of running down why this thing was removed from this list and added to this list. And the code to actually do this is very straightforward. So I'm going to see if I can show you that code really fast. And my, my timer reset, I don't know how I'm doing. Anybody know? And it ends in, do I have five, ten? Two, none. All right. Okay, I'm just going to keep, keep rolling until somebody actually like hits the sniper tower. All right. <laughs> Let's look at some code really fast. Also, always something that you 
that's easy to do in a presentation. All right, so this looks like a lot of stuff, but really all I'm doing is I'm calling the same, over and over again, I'm calling the same apply filter. And in this case, I'm calling apply filter with GIFs. And let's see if this works. And do you see that what I'm doing with that apply filter, I'll kind of gloss over what I'm doing with the apply filter, but it's talking to the controller and saying, just give me a collection that matches GIFs that have the property matching is GIF. So only is GIF is going to return in that collection. So this collection iterates and, and you'll see that it calls property URL. So I'm just watching URL. That's as much code as it took to do that. Um, let's see if this is, and here, if filter is GIFs, I'm going to return get GIFs content, which all it's doing is calling this filter property function. And then there's this goofy thing here, but this is so important. If you do this, like you'll be building cool stuff in no time. So you declare, you write a function that says watch this attribute or this property. And that's going to be this filtered content that I've actually run through a couple other filters because you can chain these things together because it's totally awesome and sweet. And I'm going to say watch each one of those for changes in the URL attribute. And so all I'm doing is I'm declaring a few of these event bindings and that winds up giving me this cool web application. It took uh, certainly less time and effort and fragility uh, from what I would normally have done in jQuery and trying to manage all that stuff. So that's, that's what I love about computed properties. Um, it basically allows you to bookmark and save gifts from Twitter. So that's, like what else in the world could you possibly want anything to do? So if we have a second, nobody's stopping me. So all right, we're going to do the super awesome bonus section. And then we're going to talk about what to select for in, in frameworks. Uh, I love Ruby and Rails community. Uh, there are lots of criteria, though, that you can choose to, to select frameworks. Uh, Brendan's money and my money is on community. I vote with community. I bet on community. Ruby is love. Uh, this is something that Dave Brady quoted uh, in a conference talk uh, a couple years ago that Matt said. And it could be mistranslated or whatever, but I actually really like that thought. It's basically like what's so weird and charming about the Ruby community. It's like a family complete with like the awkward Thanksgiving dinner where people maybe don't get along and they have differing views and they just like some little, you know, sometimes there's drama. JavaScript is party. <laughs> people come from everywhere. Some of them aren't even programmers. Some of them, uh, you know, they're front end people or other languages, .NET people. Everybody is like, just comes in and the focus is on fun and humor and drunken bar fights. So Ember is awesome because it's a way to get elements of both of those communities uh, together. I highly recommend you find a meetup uh, I happen to know of one in Austin. Um, so the thing is, for, so if I can get personal for just a second, I went with community as a new developer a few years ago. Um, it has not steered me wrong since. Uh, I really am very grateful. There's no way that I'll be, not just standing here, there's no way I'd be a programmer if it wasn't for a couple people seeing me like, and putting their arm around me and rescuing me from myself. So uh, there's been some criticisms, and some of them are very valid. There's been some criticisms of, of MVC frameworks in JavaScript, and uh, this one is pretty common. Hey, uh, I haven't heard anybody actually say this yet. Okay, so let me be the first. TweetLinks was faster and cleaner than doing this with jQuery and moving stuff around. We're talking about a very specific uh, type of application that often we find ourselves having to write that winds up turning into a ball of mud, and avoiding that at all costs is worth learning a really amazing framework. So a note on testing. This is something that I know that Ruby people are really into. I've heard. I don't know. Um, TDD is definitely encouraged. Uh, there hasn't been a, a great amount of documentation, but it's actually getting better really, really fast. In the last week, new documentation has gone up on their site. Uh, Brendan actually used Capybara back in the day, and that actually wound up being sort of suboptimal. Um, this is actually one of the fastest improving uh, communities that I've seen outside of early Rails and early, early Node. Uh, it's really cool to see this community come together. Uh, last note about functional reactive programming. So cool. You should totally check it out. Nobody in this room knows anything about it, especially not Klavnik. Oh, for real? Oh my gosh. It's like we planned this, which we totally did not. But it's worth investigating. Some resources. Uh, there's a, a JavaScript framework called BaconJS. Uh, uh, a, a fellow na named Joe Fiorini, who's super cool, uh, wrote a simple explanation about it. Um, you have no other op option in the future for learning anything about FRP, so forget it. Go home. Uh, all right, last thing. 
Thanks to Stanley, uh, who dropped Ember into, into Brendan's first project and left the app. Uh, but he's actually got a heart of gold, and there's no way this, this presentation would have ever gotten made or tweet links without his help. Um, and uh, a fellow by the name of Jeremy Rowe, who's super awesome, and uh, took me, uh, put his arm around me and, and taught Ember and, and paired with me for like six months on the application that just very, very painful early days. So it's a lot better. And uh, it's, it's the community that makes impossible things possible. So thank you guys very much. Please, no questions. JK Law. Second animated thingy. Yeah. Right. I don't know if there's time.